My name is John West. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the Asian Century Institute. I come from Australia and uh, I've had a long career in uh, international economics specialising in the Asian economy and I'm very happy to be here in Vietnam for this Harassus uh, Asia Summit. So as an expert in Asian economic development, how do you think Asian countries can better position themselves in global value chains to maximise their economic the key to participation in global value chains is attracting foreign investors. Foreign investors make uh, the global value chain work. Uh, so what's important is to be attractive to foreign investors. Attractiveness boils down to having well-qualified people, so education is important. You need ed uh, infrastructure to make the place work. Uh, you need a business-friendly environment, so investors are attracted to coming. Uh, so they are the key elements of uh, uh, the attractiveness. Now, um, that is attracting foreign investors to actually participate in global value chains. Looking over the medium term and you're looking at the example of China, what is important is to try and climb the global value chain, not just be a company doing stuff on behalf of a multinational company. You need to be doing more complex oper operations and hopefully developing your own companies that can lead global value chains. And China has been very successful in that way through companies like Huawei, Xiaomi, Oppo, who in fact have their own smartphones. Uh, China is no longer just dependent on uh, Apple and Samsung. So with your insights into Asia's economic landscape, what are the key strategies Asian nations should adopt to truly capitalize on urbanization trends? Urbanization is a very important issue, particularly in the case of global value chains. China, Vietnam, the global value chains are staffed by, very often, people moving from the country to the city. Now, uh, that means that cities are growing in much of Asia. Unfortunately, Asia has the, some of the world's worst cities as well as the, some of the world's best cities. Some of the world's best cities would be Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong. Some of the world's worst cities will be cities like Dakar, uh, Manila, and uh, maybe also Jakarta. Now, when you look at these cities, the cities that are not so good, the key problem uh, is uh, slums. And to avoid having too many slums, you need infrastructure to make the city livable. You also need economic development, so you have much less poverty. The slums boil down to poor people living in situations without infrastructure. So what measures can be taken to combat uh, economic crime in an era of advancing digital technology? Now, economic crime is a vast, vast topic, and I won't be able to cover everything, but it covers things like counterfeiting, piracy, corruption, uh, money laundering, tax evasion, and so on. And to combat economic crime, we need several things. A country needs to have the, the laws in place to combat economic crime. We need to have law enforcement agencies in place to, to enforce the, those laws. Uh, we need also need to have an open media and open NGOs who can act as a watchdog on, on criminal behavior. And to the, in today's world, crime has become globalized, like everything. And so we need to have cooperation with other countries and international organizations to, to combat economic crime. And I think economic crime really is one of the biggest issues that I, Asia has to tackle. Asia has now moved to the center of the world economy, but also to the center of the world criminal economy. So could you share insights into your background and what inspired you to write Asian Century on a night page? Well, I have a long background, and so I first visited Asia as a young backpacker in 1975. And when I traveled across Asia from Bali through to Europe by land for eight months, I fell in love with Asia, such a fascinating part of the world. Uh, after that, uh, I married an Asian lady, and so I'm half Asian in a way. She comes from the Philippines, and uh, I worked on Asian issues when I worked at the OECD in Paris. And also, uh, I lived in Japan for three years, and taught at university in Japan for 14 years 
on a part-time basis. So Asia has really been part of my life. But a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago in Australia, our government brought out a white paper on the Asian century. It was a hyper-optimistic uh, report on the Asian century and how Australia could benefit from the Asian century. As I read this report, I said to myself, have these people ever been to Asia? Because although I love Asia, Asia has many strong points and many challenges. And so I thought, I must write a book to tell the truth about Asia. That's what I attempted to do. So you and your experience at the Asian Development Bank Institute, what demographic challenges do you think are most pressing for Asia and how should they be addressed? Demography, uh, like economic crime, is probably one of the biggest issues facing, facing Asia at the moment. Uh, in countries like Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, we have aging populations. And, uh, and in these countries, they're not, apart from uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, they're not very open to migration. The result of this is that uh, Japan has been stagnating as an economy for a number of decades, and China itself has moved on to a stagnation path, I think. So that's one side of the demography uh, issue I in Asia. The other side of the demography issue is countries like India, Philippines, Indonesia, which have large youth populations. Those youth populations should be providing a big boost to the economy. But unfortunately, in none of those three countries is the government creating enough jobs and educating that youth enough. And so I would say that India, Indonesia, and the Philippines are wasting the opportunity of a potential demographic dividend and potentially storing up a social problem of unemployed youth. So could you share more about your journey as an international economist at the motivation behind your work at the Asian Sension Institute? Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, you know, uh, Asia has become part of my life and I, I, I love, I'm fascinated by, by Asia. And so through the Asian Century Institute, I uh, do research, I do lots of writing, participate in many events, and I have a network of uh, collaborators who uh, to work with me on that. And um, it's a fantastic uh, situation I'm in to be able to follow my passion. You know, uh, one of my bosses said to me many years ago, in life you have to work out what you like doing, and once you know what you like doing, if you make that your job, work is not work. And so for me, I'm, I'm not working, even when I'm working. So based on your research and analysis, what do you foresee as the future of the Asian century particularly in the context of emerging technologies and global economic shifts? Asia has immense uh, potential, immense potential for creating prosperity, for creating peace, uh, for cr creating harmony amongst nations. But Asia faces many, many challenges. And in my book that you referred to earlier, I identified seven challenges for an Asian century. One was concerning global value chains, Many Asian countries are participating in global value chains, but not climbing the ladder. Uh, another one, of course, is uh, urbanization. Asia, like, has, as I said before, has many great cities, but many cities which are not so great. Uh, demography, we've already discussed. Uh, economic crime, we've discussed. And, uh, of course, uh, I think uh, another key issue is peace between countries. And maybe challenge of having peace between countries is really the, um, uh, the greatest challenge facing Asia. Um, you know, we speak about Asia as if it's one harmonious unit, but it is not at all. Uh, in the West, we have troubles getting on together. But in fact, in Europe, countries get on. Through NATO, we get on. In Asia, we don't really have that peace and harmony amongst countries. So I think that's a, a key thing that uh, Asians have to work on. Um, perhaps as Asia meets, you've had a generation and discussions uh, with a lot of your mates here and attended the sessions built here. What do you say was your key takeaway from this particular Asian meet in Ukraine 23? I think the, the I, I mentioned two key things. There's lots of uh, optimism and energy regarding the future, particularly amongst young people. 
And of course, there's young people who will make the future of the world. And these young people are the people leading in technology. So I think that uh, there's a positive, optimistic aspect when we look at Asian youth who, who are attending the meeting. Uh, secondly, I would say that although I mentioned that peace among Asian countries is a big challenge, at a meeting like today, in the session I was just in, we had Chinese, we had Japanese, we had all sorts of people around the table, and these personal-to-person -person connections which are being forged in a meeting like Arasas can only help build the foundations for a peaceful Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure.